Hello and welcome back to some more psychology revision as we venture into more relationships with relationships in progress. Isn't that exciting? Yes. Yes, we're fascinated. We're loving it. Um, it's quite confusing because we're going to be doing formation, uh, maintenance and breakdown of relationships all in one video, hence in progress, which is always good. Um, so there is a hell of a lot to fit in. So let's get cracking uh, as we get going with the reward needs satisfaction theory. This theory is based on the idea of behaviourism, classical and operant conditioning. Operant conditioning, as you should know, is by is learning by rewards and so it is said that this is key reason why relationships are formed because it is re rewards that we receive from others. These rewards can include sex, status, love, help and agreement with our opinions. These um, may be rewarding because they meet our needs. For example, which is always good to pad out your AR1s, getting approval from others boosts our self-esteem. By operant conditioning, we like uh, those who provide us with rewards and dislike those who um, whose presence is negative. Yes. It's also been argued that classical conditioning, or learning by associations, uh, also plays an important role. By classical conditioning, we like to um, we like the people who we associate with enjoyment and satisfaction. When we experience enjoyable activities with people, it creates a positive emotional feeling known as the positive effects. So we seek to repeat these positive feelings and desire to spend more time with them. Similarly, similarly, um, we experience uh, a negative effect when we associate them with negative feelings. So we dislike them. Yes. Yes. Mm hmm. Now on to the, um, the AO2, uh, which is of this. Now on to AO2 of reward needs satisfaction. You all right? Yes. You all right? You all right? Calm down. In support of this, one study arranged a situation where a participant had the wait in an office. The radio was left on and it either played good news or bad news. Participants read a questionnaire supposedly filled in by another student um, who then they had to rate. Yes. Ratings were more positive when the good news was playing, supporting the idea that positive feelings increase uh, feelings of liking due to classical conditioning. In support of operating conditioning, one study found that strangers expressed a greater liking when rewarded by being successful in a game-like task. However, this theory can be criticised for being beaten to cultural bias as it ignores differences between cultures. The theory implies a selfish nature as we like to as we like people for the pleasures that we can get from them. Therefore it's more appropriate for individualistic cultures than collectivists as in collectivist cultures uh, that's where they put emphasis not on personal fulfillment but on what is best for the group. The theory is also reductionist as it as relationships are reduced down to the repetition of pleasurable behaviour and the avoidance of painful behaviour. It therefore focuses on the role of nurture in relationship formation ignoring nature. Even Evolutionary instincts is an example where the nature is likely to play a role as men and women um, may be uh, predisposed to seek different things from their partner due to biological differences. As we said in the last video, so males may seek fertile females and females may seek resources to maximise their reproductive success. All of that was in our last video. Yes. And finally, the arguably biggest weakness is that this theory doesn't explain why some relationships are formed even when they're not rewarding. Now on to the formation, oh, the next part of our formation video, which is the filter theory. Yes. Uh, this states that if we have a so-called field of availables, or we do, of all the possible people that we could have a relationship with. The theory says that we filter out potential uh, potential partners for different reasons at different times. So the field of um, availables is narrowed down to a relatively small field of desirables. These are the people who we would consider as potential partners. Now, if uh, there are three filters, I'm sorry, uh, to bother about. The first is social demographic variables. This is usually carried out without... Um, us being aware of it. Most people tend to mix with the people that live in the same area and go to college or work together. A much larger group of people who live in other places come from different backgrounds and are rarely, uh, sorry, are rarely encountered. This means that there are um, a small selection of people, often similar in educational and economic background and social class. This is all attributed to make up the field from which potential partners are chosen. Individual characteristics play a role um, at this stage. A small role. A small stage. role at this stage, as it is essentially filtering out anyone you are unlikely to meet, um, which sounds fair enough. Yes. Once two people start going out, you engage the next filter, a similarity of attitudes and values. If the couple shares ideas and beliefs, then communication will be easier and the relationship can progress. Yes, uh, but carry on. 
Um, but if they think differently and share few views on the world, then it's likely that the relationship will not progress much further. At this stage, people with different attitudes, values, and interests are filtered out. And finally, once a couple have established their relationship as long term, the third filter comes in. This is um, being complementary um, of any emotional needs uh, between the two people. Yes, this is how well the two people fit together, how much they meet each other's needs. Now on to the formation. Uh, the AO two. The AO two for this. Theory. Um, one supporting study um, was a longitudinal study of uh, student couples that had been together more or less than 18 months. They were asked to complete a questionnaire over a seven-month myri- period. <laughs> period. Man period. Um, <laughs> this was. Uh, it was found that the attitude sim- um, that. Attitude similar- similarity was the most important factor up to 18 months. After this time, psychological compatibility and the ability to meet each other's needs became important, therefore supporting the filter theory. However, one criticism is that it shows a uh, possible gender uh, beta gender bias as it ignores gender differences in relationship formation when each gender may filter on different characteristics. Research suggests that males and females seek different things. Buss's study of 37 cultures found that males valued physical characteristics more than women, whereas females valued earning potential. For more on this, see our last video. And finally, it is argued that this theory is beta culturally biased as it ignores cultural differences. Most research is carried out in the Western society and as a result, um, it is only relevant to relationships in individualistic societies. In collectivist societies, arranged marriages are common and are likely to be formed by different processes. Really? On to maintenance now on our first theory, which is the social Social exchange exchange theory. Um, On to... Oh, yes. That's what you just said. Yes. Um, this is an um, in economic theory based on the idea that relationships can be uh, seen in terms of exchange of uh, commodities. An exchange of commodities, yes. Essentially, it argues that we are trying to get the best bargain and it proposes that individuals are more motivated to maximise rewards and minimise costs. Rewards include companionship, sex, etc. Costs et include efforts of financial costs. Missed opportunities, <laughs> etc. According to this model for relationships, um, for rela- no, according to this relate this model for relationships to be maintained, the rewards minus the costs should be positive, so there should be pro- a profit. One key idea is that a comparison level, a standard against which all our relationships are judged, um, it is the product of our past experiences, family relationships, and the media. If we uh, judge that potential uh, profits. Uh, exceed our comparison level then the relationship will be judged as worthwhile naturally if the final result is negative then we'll be dissatisfied um a related area is idea uh, is the comparison level for alternatives this is where the person weighs up a potential increase in rewards from a different partner against any costs associated with ending the current relationship a new relationship can take the place of the current one if the current one if the profit is level is higher yes Yes. The theory has since been extended by introducing what are called investments. These are things that a person would lose if they left a relationship. So their home, mutual friends, children, etc. The theory predicts maintenance when either both partners are satisfied with rewards, uh, there are no valuable alternatives, sorry, aren't, it should probably say, there are no valuable alternatives or the costs of leaving are high. Yes. Uh, AO2 for this social exchange theory, Sarah. Uh, One supporting study interviewed women from a refuge. Yes, the study found that women who had gone back to an abusive partner were those who had the most to lose financially and who had invested heavily in terms of having children. They had generally received less serious abuse than those who had never attempted reconciliation. This shows that long-term relationships do not simply depend on rewards and punishments, but on investments too. This theory can be criticised for showing beta beta cultural bias as it ignores differences between cultures. It implies a selfish nature, as we like people for the pleasures we can get. Therefore, it's more appropriate to individualistic cultures than collectivist. Um, here, the emphasis isn't on personal fulfilment, but what, um, but on what is best for the group. Another criticism is that it's reductionist, as it reduces relationships down to the exchange of commodities. Um, this is an issue, as it implies that we operate uh, like rational accountants, but do we really keep track of costs and benefits on a daily basis? Yes. Okay. It ignores emotional aspects of in favour of logic, which uh, things aren't as simple as that. Yes. Now, also, we could all, uh, even measure the currency of complex... Oh, sorry. Shall I go again? Yes. Also, how can we even measure the currency of complex factors, like the reward of seeing children every day and watching them grow up, or the priceless reward of them face-planting in their sports day race? Oh. How much are these worth compared to the cost of arguments with the spouse? It's all very complicated. No, it isn't. 
I uh, see arguments with them. It's so oh. funny. The start of this theory is that we can explain individual differences both within and between individuals. Different individuals perceive rewards and costs very differently, so what um, is acceptable for one may not be for the other. Differences may change over time because alternatives change, with effects uh, which sorry affects the comparison level. It can be. It can explain why some people remain in unsatisfactory relationships and others um, in satisfactory ones leave. If the barriers are leaving our are high and the alternatives are not attractive, then they stay. Isn't that lovely? On to the next uh, the equity thingy. theory. Equity theory. Now the maintenance one, I believe. Yes. Go. The second theory is an extension of the first, but its central assumption is that we strive to achieve fairness in our relationships, and we feel distressed if we have unfairness. Any um any kind of inequity um has the potential to to create distress. People who give a lot in relationships and get a little in return will perceive inequity and will be dissatisfied. The same is true for those who receive great deal of um who receive a great deal and give a little in return. Yes. The greater perceived inequity, the greater the dissatisfaction. An important point I will say is that equity doesn't mean equality. It is important it is possible for each partner to contribute very different amounts and for the relationship to still be equitable. What is considered fair in a relationship is a subjective opinion for each partner. So if one person puts in less than um than the relationship will still be fair if they get less out relative to the other person. If we perceive um, ine- inequality in our relationship, then we will be motiva- motivated to restore it. We may change the amount that we put in, the amount we demand from it, or our perceptions of relative inputs and outputs in order to restore the appearance of equity. We may also compare our relationships to our comparison level to see if it's worth continuing or whether we should end it and begin a new one. Uh, onto the AO2 for equity, uh, basically in support of this one study, asked over 200 married couples to complete measures of equity and relationship satisfaction questionnaires. They found that the highest satisfaction was for spouses who perceived their relationship to be equitable, followed by um, over-benefited partners, um, followed by under-benefited partners. These findings are therefore consistent with predictions from the equity theory. This theory can... Um, or the theory can, though, be criticised for showing beta gender bias as it ignores gender differences. Research has shown that there are differences between males and females. One study using 1,500 couples um, as part of a US national survey for families and households found that if females sense being underbenefited, then the risk of divorce increases, but the same was not found for men. <gasps> and to be honest, as it's an extension of social exchange theory, most of the criticisms we said in the earlier AO2 apply to this too. It's culturally biased, as it's based on research shown in the US and therefore only relevant to individualistic societies. Please read the disclaimer. Um, please make sure you ask the bill payers permission Not before. that one. Oh. Um, in collectivist societies, relationships tend to be far more permanent than for and therefore more likely to be maintained. Terms and conditions apply. On to breakdown and our first AO1, our first theory, which is Duck's... Uh, I call it Duck's Reasons. His reasons for breakdown, really. Mm-hmm. And it's all about this guy called Duck as we begin with the reasons, which is just what I just said. <laughs> he essentially explains uh, breakdowns due to a number of factors um, that may be individually or collectively uh, weakens links between two partners. Here they are. Lack of skills. Relationships may be difficult for someone to... Uh, maybe diffi- oh, go. Relationships may be difficult for some people who lack the necessary skills to make the relationship mutually satisfying. Those lacking social skills may be poor um, conversationalists and may be poor at indicating their interest in others or just the fact that they perceive... Others perceive them as not being interested. Therefore, the relationship breaks down before it really gets going. Like a stimulation. According to social exchange theory, people look for rewards in relationships. One of these is stimulation, and a lack of stimulation could be the reason for relationship breakdown. One study found that people often said boredom or lack of change uh, was the reason for the breakdown. And finally, maintenance difficulties. There are clearly some circumstances where relationships become strained because partners find it difficult to maintain close contact. Um, Live and working apart, going away to university, etc. may place strain on existing relationships. AO2 for Duck's reasons. Uh, They're basically criticised for showing beta gender bias as it ignores differences between genders as a reason for dissolution, really. And research has shown that there are gender differences. Women are more likely to um, stress unhappiness and incompetence. 
compatibility, whereas men are more likely to cite sexual withholding. It's disgusting. Also, women are more likely to want to remain friends, whereas men would like to cut their losses. It may also show culture um, beta cultural bias as it, as it ignores differences between cultures, assuming that all relationships break down in the same way as in the US, where the research was based. In collective societies, relationships are far more permanent. For example, divorce rates in China are, are only 4%. Da, da, da. Therefore, the reasons they break down are likely to be more serious, like violence. Another criticism is that factors given by Doug are the opposite to those that lead to initial attraction. One suggestion is the fatal attraction theory, which is the complete opposite, suggesting that factors that lead to the initial attraction are often the ones that ultimately spell the end of the relationship. For example, you may have find your new girlfriend... Let me as finish, she's... woman. Oh. Carry on. For example, you might find your new girlfriend as she is really loud, but you notice her in a busy place. Then... When you're alone together and she keeps shouting in your ear, well, it's fatal. Mm -hmm. Another criticism is, or, um, is that although Duck gives uh, reduced proximity as a cause of main maintenance difficulties, research also shows that some relationships uh, do strive. Long-distance relationships and friendships are common. One study found that 70% of students sampled had experiences, uh, sorry, had experienced at least one long-distance rel romantic relationship. And 90% had experienced at least one long-distance friendship. And finally, on to the last breakdown, a uh, little theory you need, which is Duck's phase model, the phases of breakdown. Yes, as well as the reasons Yes, behind. so he got, basically, Duck got busy forming his model for the later phases of a close relationship. So go. First, firstly, firstly, the intrapsychic phase where where one of the partners becomes increasingly dis dissatisfied in the relationship. They tend to spend a lot of time thinking about the situation, dwelling on their unhappiness. At this stage, their concerns are not discussed with their partner. If the dissatisfaction is enough, they can move to... The dyadic phase, where the dissatisfied person expresses their dissatisfaction with the other partner. It if the dissatisfaction is not acceptably resolved, then it progresses to the next stage. The social phase, where, uh, where sorry, if attempts to negotiation is, attempts to negotiate fail, then the intention to break up is made public. Most part, both parties um, now confide in close friends and family. The person who is being left may try to enlist others to talk to the dissatisfied one, while the other one will justify their actions. If the relationship is not saved here, then it goes to the final stage. The grave dressing stage. No one does not kill the other. Here, ex-partners publicise their own accounts of their breakdown. The main purpose of this stage is for both parties to present an image of themselves that defends their reputation and allows them to go into another relationship. This is not only necessary in order to convince a new partner as uh, that they are a reasonable bet, but also to maintain their own self-esteem. Now, at each stage, the dissatisfied partner reaches a point uh, that tips them over to the next stage. These are breaking point. These breaking points are called thresholds. Essentially, it's three strikes and you're out. Now, on to the AOT for Duck's phase model. One strength of this theory is that it has important applications. It is useful for supporting people to go through breakups as it forms the basis for the model to repair relationships. Yes, uh, by identifying the stage of the breakdown, different strategies can be implemented. In some stages, some strategies work better than others. For, for example, if the two... In the first two stages, advising the person to focus on the positives rather than the neg negatives may repair the situation. Later on, counselling will uh, them sorry will separate. Oh God, go. Later on, counselling uh, counselling them separately to minimise the damage of the split may be better. It can be criticised for being beta culturally biased as it ignores differences between cultures. It's based on studies of married couples in the US and therefore may not be applicable to other cultures. Yes. Divorce rates tend to be much lower in collectivist cultures and so the processes are likely to be different. For example, in collectivist cultures, the social network plays a large role in providing uh, support to couples with problems and so prevents them from getting out of hand. That's not Facebook, that's the actual social network. Mm -hmm. A criticism though is that it's too rigid as in assuming that every breakdown goes through the same stages. Some people enter the relationships without saying much and some go very publicly mental. Not everyone responds in the same way to a relationship breakup. Some take an active role to either salvage the relationship or speed it up. Um, others take a more passive role, waiting for things to improve or just letting the relationship slowly end. Yes, and that's it. That's the formation, maintenance and unfortunately the breakdown, which is all very depressing. Yeah. So there we are. That's it. Join us next time for some other factors as we do childhood experiences and cultural something cross-cultural yes. something to do with that thank you for listening Thanks. goodbye